All right, welcome back to AI4 2021 Finance Summit presented by Dot Data. Our next panel is titled Risk Management's AI Evolution. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. All right, let's let's jump in. Big, big welcome to the stage, Mira, Agus, and Roy. And my name is Salah. Um, we have a fascinating panel for you. Uh, it's all around the risk management evolution and how risk management has changed. If you go back to the 2008 crisis, you know, uh, banks were up to um, some, some interesting activity pre that, right? And so we had to kind of uh, fix things, clean up our act, and um, the regulators helped us along the way. And you know, capital R risk, and then capital M management was a big, big focus. And the focus was around you know three lines of defense: one, two, and three. Just like trench warfare, right? You had to kind of pass the first line, the second line, and the third line, and you had to breach all of those for there to be an event. And the first line is all about how the frontline units, the businesses, basically need to own risk. Don't make you know mistakes. So if you're issuing credit or you're making trades make the right decisions, you know, include risk in your decisions. And then you had risk management, which was a second line of defense, reporting to the CEO, whether it's credit risk or liquidity risk or model risk. And then you had the third line, which is audit. And audit's all about making sure and monitoring the first and second line. And that's how risk management basically evolved over the last um, 10 odd years. And this is what we're gonna talk about. So let's move into the, uh, actually, sorry, uh, apology. Let's do a quick round of introductions. Um, and I'll start myself first. Uh, my name is Salah Khawaja. I've uh, worked on Wall Street for 20 odd years. I started off at Deloitte in management consulting and spent 10 years running transformation projects, uh, primarily in the risk space, and then moved to JP Morgan and did the same for about five years there. That actually took me out to Tokyo and Hong Kong, had a great Asia experience in the last five years. I've been running an automation team, including AI in risk management at Bank of America, having a, having a great time. So that's that's a bit about me and um, our esteemed panelists. Uh, August, we'll start with you now. Marcus Sugianto, I'm the head of corporate model risk uh, for Wells Fargo. I oversee all the uh, model that's in production for Wells Fargo. Thank you, August. Mira, you're up next. Thanks, Sally. Uh, Mira Das, uh, I work for BMO Financial Group. Um, I lead the uh, AML modeling and uh, machine learning group where uh, a lot of the work that we do is uh, implementing machine learning solutions for uh, financial crime uh, problems and other uh, in several business areas. Thank you, Mira. Roy, over to you. Hi guys, pleasure to be here. So I'm Roy, I'm Beyond Minds uh, CTO and a co-founder um, Beyond Minds is an AI solution provider. We're working with uh, top global 2000 uh, companies in financial services and insurance, solving core problems alongside AML, fraud, risk elements, uh, lots of automation, lots of uh, very cool AI projects. Um, and looking forward for the panel discussion. All right. Thank you, Agus, Mira, and Roy. All right, Patrika, let's get into this and let's tee up the first question. So the first question is, since the 2009 financial crisis, how has risk management evolved? So August, we'll go to you first, and then sure. Mira and Roy, feel free to add some thoughts. Sure, so for sure, the uh, bank since then, with all the introduction of uh, regulation becoming very, very strong in the capital management in particular, uh, in the risk management and, uh, and capital management in particular. So as you can see, in the uh, current crisis, uh, banks coming out very, very strong in terms of the capital position. Mm -hmm. I'm going to speak very specifically on the uh, on the model risk. How do we manage model? It's day and night. If we look at how we manage model back then, which uh, part of the problem in 2009 crisis was model, uh, part of the blame in there, uh, to today. So uh, with the uh, introduction of SR 11.7, OCC 11-12, the uh, all all the banks have uh, have a maturing uh, model risk management uh, program and process. So we've been more than ten years now in that journey. So models are very very well managed, particularly for large banks. So that's a humongous humongous difference 
So when we're coming to this COVID-19, everybody knows a very transparent how to manage model, very, very well prepared because all models are wrong and many of them are going wrong, went wrong during the COVID-19, but all the banks manage model very, very, very well. Hey, Agus, some, some great points, right? And just to kind of uh, draw a parallel, you know, M Microsoft created a chatbot and when people started interacting with it, you know, they said it sent some wrong signals and humans being humans, the model started becoming racist, right? So those are the things that we in banks want to avoid, right? When a COVID-19 like event happens, you've got all these anomalies coming in. How do you retrain the models? How do you look at those anomalies? And then capital planning, I think you're, you're spot on, right? There's a, such an amazing focus on capital management just to make sure that if you think about the 2008 crisis, how you know banks had to be bailed out by the government, right? And now mm -hmm. we have enough capital, enough buffer that in the event of a crisis like COVID-19, we basically have enough buffer in place. And there were additional tests, especially some of the big banks like ours, Wells Fargo and Bank of America, we had to do additional tests over the last six months to ensure mm -hmm. that you know the safety and soundness of the, the financial system. Mira, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I echo both of your thoughts, especially around the uh, governance aspect of what Angus uh, mentioned, which was around um, the lack thereof of, of much uh, governance around risk management programs. And, you know, I think beyond that, I think having a plan is important, but then also being able to execute on that plan, because just building on, on the whole COVID-19 um, and, and really the technology that we all use, Certainly one aspect is making sure that yes, you're, you know, you're prepared from a model perspective and everything can, can certainly run from a model perspective, but then also ensuring that your technology, your systems and everything when your entire workforce goes um, remote, <laughs> certain other aspects of risk management then um, really came into the limelight, right? Because things like um, you know, having continuity planning and things like that were sometimes a checkbox exercises you know, for most risk management programs. But now I think given what we've seen in the last year, it, it, it takes on a little bit more importance there. And then I also think from a capital perspective, yes, I mean, in terms of your exposure in, in certain industries, given what's happening right now in our economies and, you know, depending on what, you know, where your bank is at in terms of your exposure, that will have a huge impact on your risk management program as well. So I think all of those aspects, you know, I think beyond model risk and you look at general risk management um, come into play, um, you know, since since 2009. Yeah, great, great points, Mira, you know, you're spot on, right? Let, let no crisis go to waste, right? Um, coming out mm -hmm. of the, the COVID crisis, we had to do so much, right? Working from home, digitization, model risk, et cetera. Great points, Mira. Roy, over to you. I know you run a pretty big um, AI team at Beyond Mind, so, so we'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, I, I wasn't really around in 2009, but what I know about crisis in history, that's when a crisis is a, is a opportunity for change, growth, um, adopting new technology. And I think, well, you know, we are in the fourth revolution, right? It's all about data. It's all about what to do with this data. Data is all around. And definitely since 2009, we, we saw like significant change in way companies, banks, financial institutes are collecting data, using data uh, for better decision, for better monitoring. And I think we will touch that in the in further on in the panel, but in the AI aspects of what we currently see in this crisis and, and since 2009 is that it's about evergreen AI, right? How we are bringing uh, AI into current risk management that is robust, stable, even in, in when, when severe changes appear, when the environment is, is changing. Think about the data change and shift that happens since the, this crisis started. Like this data change, shift and change will ruin any known train model that was based on, on previous data. Now, can you adopt to this new trend, new data fastly in production? monitoring and be able to even to, to alert uh, the users, the data science team, the AI teams that something is, is changing. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's all about change from 2009 till today, we saw a lot of change. We still exa uh, 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 experiencing significant change and with AI and data and technology and process, 
it's it's all evolving and it's it's definitely bright future although uh we are witnessing a crisis while we speak yeah really great 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 points on the data front right i think sometimes this analogy works and sometimes it doesn't how data is fueling ai right and and you know, you know the data that series that was there before covid you know you trained all the models and suddenly the series completely changes and it throws everything out of whack right and that actually tees up the next question uh, patrika when you get a chance if you can move there you know what 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 challenges does ai present to risk management right and and roy maybe i'll come back to you from a, a a data perspective right that what what are you seeing you know when you're building out your product and your platform your vantage point i know you're focused on financial services and the insurance sector you know whether it's data or just other challenges that you see from a ai perspective and how you know it's hindering some adoption or even kind of that hockey stick right how will it take off yeah well there are so many so many challenges around ai and specifically around around risk but i don't know just just few on top of my head on that is so of course you have explainability trust aspects bias aspects um how you how you predict the confidence and uncertainty of models how you combine human in the loops lots of different tech technology aspects that need to come into into place when you are uh, deploying uh, and and take ai into production so it's it's definitely not about let's collect data train an amazing model in the lab get to 95% accuracy and put it in production right that that doesn't work and i think uh um, the, the the ecosystem is evolving and and companies uh, are, are more and more aware of that right it's not about okay let's build a center of excellence bring 100 phd's in ai and they will solve our models uh, i think there are a lot of challenges uh, for example recently I, I read a survey talking about that for every one dollar that is spent about building models there are hundred dollars that are spent on deploying maintenance updates operation right this is this is the, the the big area this is this is the complex and a, a, another challenge maybe that i recently uh, hearing a lot from, from, from clients and 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 fs um, is is about the reconciliation uh, which is a nightmare right so many different systems data is spread even if 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 we're progressing around maturity, still there are so many different systems. Um, the data is, is messy, is complex. How to harvest the, the real value with AI from this data is, is a challenge. Um, and I think around that, maybe touching one last point around management aspect of that strategy on how to use this data, how to invest in fundamentals, in systems, uh, and even even buy versus build strategy is not very clear today, and and I think there is a lot of way to accelerate this adoption, this transformation, uh, for a better process. Yeah, really spot on. I mean, data is is a massive challenge, right? It's it's so much uh, disparate of infrastructure. You got gaps in data, and how do you bring it all together? And then you know you you build the models, like you said, one dollar and the hundred dollars come in in terms of implementation. And then I think all of our organizations are, you know, very responsible organizations, right? We're not Facebook. We don't move fast and break things. We take the responsibility and the trust that's given to us around basically having people's money seriously, right? We don't want to, you know, break things. And as a result, you want to make sure there are organizations like Model Risk and August would love to get your thoughts on, you know, how, <laughs> how, how, how that plays in, right? Yeah, make sure that, yeah. that trust that's given to us, we take it seriously. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for for that question. So I think uh, I, I want to bring it uh, a little bit very basic in the model race, right? We know all models are wrong, all AI are wrong, and when they are wrong, they create harm to the institution or they create harm to our customer. So understanding the potential harm and unintended consequences is very important, and then from there to understand what is the cause, what is the root cause of harm so we can manage it. That's very important. We talk about data, we start from the data piece. Data is a uranium. If you don't manage it well, it's radioactive here. You know, it will hurt because of privacy issue, because of data security, information security. So data can be radioactive. Yeah, it can be useful and very powerful, but it can have a radioactive effect as well if we don't manage it well. So start from data because of privacy, info security, and bias coming out from, from that data. Then we're talking about the model itself. 
the model, in, unlike the, the, the traditional model, that's very, very interpretable. We're talking about model that's very, very complex. If we're talking about deep learning, we're talking about using ReLU deep learning, it has a thousand and million local linear equation inside there. So uh, the how how we how we train them the the parameter is depend on the choice of hyperparameter so it's a complexity of that and then with the, that complexity the environment environment change the covid 19 uh, taught us a lot of that right suddenly things change how do you manage a complex system in the changing environment so i think that is something that we we we, we care about so we have to manage all the aspect from data, from the modeling, from the parameters, from the environment and how we're going to retrain it and change control and all of these things that are becoming, uh, you, uh, the, the, the challenge becoming much bigger than the, than the traditional model. Yeah, l love the analogy of uranium, right? How it, it actually can fuel something and it can be used for, for good. And then it's got this other side, which basically, you know, the radioactive side, right? So you got to basically balance it really well. Mira, any, any thoughts on that from your vantage point and, and BMO group? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to speak a little bit from the perspective of financial crime where, you know, when uh, machine learning and AI sort of made its debut in this area, everybody thought it was going to be the huge uh, David that was going to kill the false positive Goliath, right? And in, in certain cases, yes, I mean, it has given um, a lot of, um, you know, optima, optimal output from what you need to look at. However, what, what a lot of people don't look at, and I know uh, Roy um, kind of touched on this from an, a deployment standpoint, when you're looking at your operational teams and they're looking at the interpretation and the output of these models, you, you can't underestimate the change management aspect that goes into changing from a traditional or a model that they're used to looking at to what they're going to be looking at. And when you start getting into um, tons of features that, that a lot of these models are based on, it, the learning curve and what occurs as a result of that and, 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 and whether or not it really is a time savings, there has to be a lot of um, thought that goes into whether or not it's worth even putting in a machine learning or AI model sometimes because it's it's not as simple as hey we're gonna you know we're gonna <laughs> kill all your false positives but hey we're gonna double or triple your caseload where your operation cost then goes through the roof right and you know there's things like that where you don't necessarily consider it from a model perspective but more from the operation standpoint so I think from that perspective I I, I think. Um, certainly there are a lot of challenges that we haven't not necessarily thought through as we, as we deploy these types of models more and more. Hey, Mira, great, great thoughts. And, and that kind of tees up the, the next question here, Patricia, and, and that's the question around which opportunities, um, you know, does AI present to risk managers, right? And, and if you kind of think about it, 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 over the summer, we witnessed how, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, uh, boiled over. Right, and you think about decisions that banks have made over years and decades, and there's how there's bias in those decisions. Where if you were an affluent, you know, white family, you might have gotten the mortgage versus not. If you think about even just even within white people, like if you think about CEOs, there are more CEOs named John than women CEOs, and even that, it's kind of like, hey, you got to be a certain height requirement. So if you're a short white guy, you get screwed, right? And so how do you translate that from a data perspective, where you've got AI making or first being trained? and then eventually making prediction decisions based on biased data. So I guess the question that you know, I'm posing to, to you all, and feel free whoever wants to jump in first, you know, which opportunities does AI present to uh, risk managers? I, I, okay. I can start, go, go ahead, go ahead, Mira. No, 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 no oh, go ahead. So I was, gonna, I was gonna say from a responsible AI perspective, and I think we've all heard that term really uh, thrown around the industry, which is around, understanding how some, I mean, traditional models, I mean, it doesn't matter the modality of the model, you can have bias depending on what your input is going to look like. And I think it's important to have frameworks depending on what the output of those models are used for um, in, in terms of how some of those input features are going to impact your models. And again, this 
goes back to model risk where it's not just about you know leaving it up to the business in terms of what variables you're going to use but understanding what that impact is going to be from a reputational risk perspective and really an impact to your customer risk right because if um to your point i mean if certain types of variables are used from um you know even something as small as a zip code would have adverse effects if you're looking at adjudication type models and it's just built into the bias of just how those um really those neighborhoods and how um you know basically diverse they can be or not be so i think where the opportunity lies is that you know we have the benefit of history we know what what went wrong the first time around when some of those models were being built um, and really, we should be able to address that in a much more responsible and uh, manner when we're deploying the models these days. Yeah, we are spot on. Uh, you know, I know Bank of America, we believe in responsible growth and, and, and we throw around responsible AI, right? You want to have the guardrails in place. And maybe, August, you were going to go there in terms of model risk. You've got to put the guardrails in place. You don't want the, the model to veer off, right? So, August, would love to get your thoughts. Yeah, for, first of all, I, I will look at want to talk about the opportunity first. Yeah, uh, we've been using banks has been using mod have been using model for years, uh, particularly uh, managing the financial risk. The opportunity is now we also able to ap apply model, particularly on the unstructured data, be it um, mainly on the natural language processing side. So the opportunity of dealing with uh, non financial risk. So managing better non-financial risk. So humongous, humongous upside on that. Uh, we yeah, and then I'll I'll talk about the the model risk a little bit later. But we also the, the opportunity is we're dealing with the uh, arm risk of model. So Bank of America, you use model. BMO, you use model. Uh, Wells Fargo, we use model. So we use it's just an arm risk of model. It's the the uh, the effect of uh, the uh, if you don't uh, the the adverse selection. If you don't have the best model, you have out for selection. The, 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 the less desirable one will, will, will come to you if your model is not sophisticated enough, be it in credit, be it in fraud. It's uh, the this, this situation is like that. So it's an arm race or model. So we have to, uh, to have to compete with model. Secondly, the, uh, the, we are against increasingly very, very sophisticated at machine learning, adversarial environment driven by machine learning, particularly on the cyber and fraud. So we are competing with the, the bad actor that are using machine learning as well. So we 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 have to do that. The 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 rapid evolving strategy, particularly probably on the dynamic pricing and all of those things. So the opportunity to create a uh, helping to, to 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 create strategy real time through probably through reinforcement learning and then with the uh, the a lot of information out there humongous exabyte information every day how to make sense out of that uh, and 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 uh, looking for the, uh, uh, the 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 needle in the haystack so that kind of things it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an opportunity but after saying that though uh, three things that I want to look at in terms of more risk managing model risk so first of course when you, you're talking about responsible ai we need to start with the interpretable model so a lot of people talk about explainable ai sometimes i have to bite my tongue because the uh, the explainability tool uh, can be very very complicated it's not easy to explain so we need to look at explain uh, interpretable machine learning not only explainable machine learning so we work a lot on that we published a few paper on how to do sophisticated machine learning that's interpretable second is model robustness or adversarial adversarial in, 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 in operating under adversarial environment how do we know our model will be fail how do we know in in, in traditional model is very easy to understand that in, in, in this situation is a lot more complex. So how to test model for, for robustness when environment change and credit model, we cannot retrain model all the time. It has to stay in through time. So that's uh, because credit is you originated now, it's going to go back during the crisis. So, so having robust model is very, very important. And then we are talk about uh, uh, the, the the fairness aspect, right? The the fairness and the the ethical aspect. Do we want to apply it uh, if we know the the data is not uh, is 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 is, uh, is a lot of bias in there, or, or should should we even do it? Yeah, great, great points, Agus. Um, Roy, over to you to add some thoughts. 
Yeah, so I, I think Agus touched some uh, really, really interesting points. I, I see the main opportunity uh, around credit risk and probably around AML. Uh, like uh, in terms of use cases, what AI can really offer uh, around risk management, I think AML is an amazing uh, opportunity. And and actually, I, I'm not sure what's the situation in, in Wells Fargo or Bank of America, but uh, industry-wide, I see false alarm rates as around 90%, right? Um, how, do, how do you deal with 90% false alarm rate? How many alerts this team should get in order to really find the, the, the right alerts, what should be investigated, what should be reported? Um, it, it's a really complex uh, uh, scenario. And, um, you know, uh, I won't guarantee uh, on that, but I would say that AI for sure can cut that by half, right? And, and probably more. Um, but, but of course, it's, it's involved uh, some risk, risk taking in order to reduce the holistic risk in, a, in AML, right? Um, and, and, and I think today with 90% false alarm rate, uh, with a lot of rule-based mechanism, we are taking a significant risk around around AML, right? It's not only so, about Roy. Probably uh, my question to you: You're talking about ninety percent of the false positive, right? Yeah. Now yeah. we're talking about false negative. Okay, let's part for the sure. about, because at the end of the day, AML is a false negative. Okay, if you're asking model risk guy like sure. me, number one is uh, false negative. False yeah. positive is your problem, business problem, okay? So yeah. false negative. So now we're asking the SA officer to commit. How much false negative can you accept? And how do you know? To do, then you have to do below the line testing. I think AI has opportunity to do that because below the line testing today, a lot of manual laborious activity in the AML world if your model risk asks you to do below the line testing. That is uh, something that we don't catch. Uh, so how do you sample it? And with rare event. So the below the line testing is humongous. That's then you require army of people to do manual work. So what can AI do? Not only to address the false positive, but addressing false negative, particularly on the below the line testing. Well, oh, Oh, wait no, no, one no. second. So of course, false negative, right? You know, it's it's an it's an AI problem, right? It's it's never only about precision. It's only about it's also about recall, right? What is the right working point for the business in terms of risk, right? Of course, I I can say that that uh, you know nothing is nothing is AML, and then I will be amazing in false <laughs> false. Uh, but but you know it's it's, it's and, and you know seriously it's it's all about the right uh, uh, working point right I don't want to miss any false negative right but I, w I we must uh, reduce the false alarm rate otherwise we can't really handle this amount of alerts right it's actually causing a risk of finding this this uh, opportunities and and. I think what distinguish AML from fraud, because in fraud we have seen like tremendous improvement in, in the last few years. But in fraud, you have this feedback that coming back from users, from clients all the time, right? Someone blocked my transaction, someone didn't block my fraud uh, transaction. But in AML, you don't have this feedback. Uh, but what you do have is years of history of investigation and reports that have been written, right? And you can use NLP to extract information from this report. You can enhance the rule-based system with an AI layer that will sit on top of this rule-based. And last, of course, you need to employ an anomaly detection mechanism in order to detect what's never been detected before because it doesn't flow into the rules. I think that on that, AI has an amazing uh, opportunity to really bring a change. So th this is a real opportunity. Um, and with the amount of money that is invested worldwide around AML, giving the 1% that actually being caught, um, I think we have a lot to progress there, definitely reducing risk um, uh, uh, for, for companies. And, and one, maybe one last uh, uh, point, I think that credit risk is another amazing uh, uh, opportunity around underwriting, around automation, around aggregating more data, enhancing data, 
um, and you know how 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 to um, to uh, more accurately um, do credit scoring, but how also um, uh, look at this uh, uh, loan portfolio, increasing it, um, but still maintain a very moderate risk levels. Um, I, I, can I be contrarian on that, Roy? For sure. That's that's why we're here for to this. Yeah. So I think credit risk, if the way we do it today, it will be the least opportunity. This is the area that has been, we have quants that working on this, refining their craft for the last 30 years. So unless, unless we introduce new data, unless we introduce alternative data, you will not get anything from credit risk because the constraint is so much. Some of the things, uh, if we've just put uh, put the machine learning, throw it in the wild, yeah, you get improvement. Then you say, well, this factor has to be monotonic. Suddenly your capability is gone. This effect has to be monotonic, gone. So, 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 so if, if we have to, if we stick with the current data, the, 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 the the impact of machine learning are probably almost nil. Yeah, very very tiny. Okay. <laughs> so hey, but, let, let me let me let me let me mediate that a bit, right? I think the the alternative <laughs> data is is a very interesting example, and let's think about like even climate risk, right? A, a massive new area that's going to emerge, and there's going to be a, a huge set of alternative data that's going to appear. Um, I was you know part of an interesting project where you could be in the same zip code, same neighborhood, and the risk to the property is different because one property is higher, one property is lower. So suddenly you're going to have some of that data that's going to flow in. And when you're looking at credit risk, hey, should I give credit to the person who's got the house here or the house here? And what is my exposure? And you know, what's the interest rate around that? And so I think it's going to be fascinating. And I think, you know, like you said, I think, Augusto, you're spot on, right? You know, the, the traditional credit risk, people have honed their craft and it's in a solid place. You know, how much more lemon juice are you going to extract? But then you look at the alternative data and maybe some new things that will appear. And I think there will be Gen two, Gen three, mm -hmm. um, and, and and time will tell. You know, is it going to be just this much juice or this much juice or you know a lot more, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, I think I think if we can if we can do it do it in the uh, uh, following the rule and the law because this is a very regulated entity, right? So we have the uh, uh, equal credit uh, opportunity act right and all of those things a lot of rule that we have to play so using using the uh, uh, back to the uh, responsible uh, responsible ai using the data in a responsible way to 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 provide more credit opportunity not being discriminatory so that's that's i think i think it's the key and we we are just uh, starting on that uh, and in 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 that in that area but that's 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 i think that's the name of the game because what's this uh this machine learning really good at is really feature engineering and feature engineering for data that you're not very familiar with that's why in fraud is very successful because things change very very rapidly credit risk is a very very different environment yeah absolutely yeah, go ahead, Roy. But yeah it's, it's a fascinating uh, uh discussion and and uh, you know basically basically i agree but i think there are so so much data that is is not yet being used and i'm i'm not sure we are ready to use it in terms of, of fairness but uh um, i think the opportunity in credit scoring and ai and and fairness is really to be much more fair than what we are currently do be yeah. I think AI can, I love the term segment of one, right? AI can really look at, at individual on the individual level uh, without the need of buckets and segmenting and, and, and you know, rule-based systems um, and the way currently credit scores uh, models are, 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 are built and used, look at people in groups, right? Not on the individual level. And I think, uh, the technology is, is approaching there. I don't think that AI is totally there in terms of like generalization, that it can really look at the individual level, but it's, it's going that, that, that direction and, and it's going to be much more fair than human can, can ever be, um, which is an amazing uh, opportunity. And, and I think one last question about, uh, uh, um, last one comment about that is that if you will take uh, human judgment and you will check agreement between experts. There is real opportunity 
to build a NAI that will be more uh, more Consistent. aligned with the majority than each individual separately. Yeah. And and this is amazing in terms of fairness. Even if if the if the bank won't earn more money because of a better better model in terms of of risk, it will be more fair, which is a, an amazing opportunity. Yeah, Roy, I think that point on fairness is a good one and actually leads me to the next question, which is, you know, around which regulatory developments around risk management and AI do you expect in the next five years? And we talked about, you know, transparency and explainability of the AI models, right? And fairness is going to be a big topic, right? Why did the model decide what it decided, right? Really digging into the root cause and showing that and driving the, the, the fairness. Because at the end of the day, humans also make mistakes, right? Humans get tired. So how can AI go above and beyond that? And I think, you know, there's this whole concept of AI singularity where, you know, the AI is gonna go crazy, not gonna happen because you're gonna have smart people like August who's gonna make sure model risk is there, right? And also you have to keep in mind that it's gonna be always humans and AI together, right? Monitor the AI, find the exceptions, when COVID-like events happen or even minor events happen day to day, adjust the model, right? Feature engineering, et cetera, where you keep constantly, you know, training or minute adjustments to make sure things are working. And, um, you know, from a explainability perspective, it's all good, right? So back to the question, right? You know, wh what are the big uh, re regulatory uh, things that you would predict? Like look into your respective crystal balls, right? And, oh, by the way, there's a bet on this, right? So, so we're going to call you back in five years. And if you got it wrong, you're going to be in trouble. But, um, <laughs> you know, the jokes aside, well, look into your crystal ball, right? And, 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 and tell us what you think. You, you want me to start? Go for it, Roy. <laughs> yeah, so I, I actually don't think we need a crystal ball. I think that the Singaporean uh, regulator uh, already did most of the work. Um, so I think there are seven, seven rules that, that are still involving, but uh, um, they give very good uh, baseline. So it's explainability, which is very straightforward. I think everybody is talking about explainability, although as a researcher, I'm saying that we're just playing with explainability. We're not even scratching the surface <laughs> about really explaining the models. Um, but that's, that's a different topic. Uh, and then we have repeatability, which is super imp important. I think, Agus, you, you touched that. That's, that's a super interesting uh, domain, uh, very active in research today. And, and I think it's, it's very important. Uh, then you probably have uh, uh, tuning and regular tuning, right? How you monitoring, how you adopt, how you change towards the environment, towards new data. Um, and, and that's, that's bring whole set of technology aspects uh, and challenges to solve in terms of, okay, what I, I need really to train the models all the time with new data, how I'm going to do that. That's a whole set of challenges, but I think we can, we're, we're going there, active learning, et cetera. Uh, robustness, open challenge, new challenge, how to deal with noisy data. I think, you know, I, I, when I'm trying to explain robustness to, to people, I'm giving a very simple example, right? You train a dog versus cat image classifier, and that classifier got an image of a giraffe, right? What will happen? And, and the truth is that the model we said, it's a dog in a 99% uh, um, uh, uh, probability, right? And, and that's of course a more a, a classic model in deep learning, right? Softmax uh, probabilities doesn't mean anything. And, and building robustness is hard. You need systems. You need much more than models to do this. To that you need out of distribution detection and confidence estimation and different mechanism, how to combine human in the loop and what should, what should look uh, in a second judgment, et cetera. Uh, then you have uh, traceability. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a super well defined uh, yet in terms of, of the regulator, but I think giving a decision making, uh, uh, data sets and, and process that yield uh, uh, the model decision uh, and, and documents, do um, you need to be able to trace this decision um, again and again? Uh, auditability, uh, right? You need, you need audit, you need monitoring, you need to understand what's going on under the hood. And and uh, and last one is is uh, reproducibility, right? I want to be able at each time to build the same model, the same aspect, and to get exactly the same uh, result. Um, and so it's it's like stable. Um, so I think that that's my seven rules that I'm following. I think that it's a it's a good start. Thank you, Roy. Mira, over to you. 
Well, I'd say, I mean, most of those seven are pretty applicable regardless of whether or not you're using machine learning or AI, right? I mean, things around, um, you know, being able to replicate your model results, being able to do back testing, those are things that were defined in uh, really 2011-12, really, when you think about it. But um, I think a lot of um, where the regulators will, will sort of start differentiating what you can and can't do will come from self-learning models versus non-self-learning models. Because I think where they get a little bit more nervous is if you are taking over, you know, pretty much the decision-making um, process of a human, you know, end-to-end, -end, right? Because one of the things I want to touch on, and this really um, um, touches on some of the stuff Rory was saying in the last, uh, the last couple of comments, was around you know using AI to cut false positives. You can certainly build a model to cut something by false positives by say 95%. Good luck selling that to a regulator, right? And really the comments around that will be, and this goes back to what we were saying for model risk, is you might be cutting things that you don't wanna see. What are you missing that you do want to see? And that's where the balance, the art, the risk tolerance really comes into play in terms mm -hmm. of how that's going to work together, right? It's not just about the models. It's about how that model is working mm -hmm. with the business. And once you, once you look at that, that is where I think the regulators are going to focus. It's not just going to be on the technical aspect. It's going to be on, does the business understand what this model is giving you? Do, do they understand how this output is going to affect some of the impacts of the risk management that, they're, or that, that, that model is doing for them? So I think, I, I think that, in my opinion, is where the regulators probably will focus a little bit more versus look, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're always going to have, you know, certain groups within the regulators that are going to look at the details in the model. That is not going to go away. But how that is going to impact business and whether or not all the business stakeholders understand what you're doing, I think that is where they will focus a little bit more when you're implementing these types of models. Yeah, great thoughts, Mira. All right, Agus, over to you. Yeah, I, I probably want to talk a, a couple of points. First is uh, I'm expecting that the uh, more regulation will be coming. But my hope, my hope will be because everybody using machine learning, everybody using model, the regulation apply to everybody equally. So we have a equal uh, playing ground, uh, level playing ground, because that's not the case today. We cannot do our banks. We will not do a certain things. Uh, especially, for, for example, for target, uh, targeted, uh, target marketing. Well, the, the tech, in tech platform, there is a wild, wild west. So, so I think when, when, when the regulatory is, is a new regulation is introduced, my hope it will be applied to all industry, not only certain things, because then we will have uh, some arbitrage loopholes and all those things, unlevel playing field. So today between fintech and banks need to play in the same uh, the same rules. So I think that's a very, very important whoever going to craft, whoever coming up with regulation, because it will impact everybody, impact customers. So I, I would say, uh, please apply to everybody. Secondly, in terms of focus, in my view, I, I, I spoke about this a little bit at the beginning, in terms of harms, an unintended consequence of the model will do. So model safety, around uh, model safety, that's something that uh, uh, we need to pay a lot of attention, be it regulated or not regulated, but we need to pay attention a lot of a lot on in that. And, and that's coming from all the aspect that I spoke before on the data, what data is allowed and be used and cannot be used, what data allowed to be shared and not shared and all of those things. Those are, uh, in the, we, we already seen it through GDPR and through uh, uh, the CCA and all of those things. So that will be more and more, right? The alternative data, what can we do? What can we use? How do we use it? So, so that's uh, for sure, it will be uh, something important because it impact impact model safety or 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 or, or harm so so that, i think that's something that i would like to uh, to to highlight in addition to what what roy and, and mira already talked about yeah what, i think an interesting yeah. aspect about uh, data by the way is is okay you have a list of data that you cannot use right it's 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 not good to use this data but can this data be concluded from the rest of the data that that's a rabbit hole, and and that's that's an interesting risk, and and 
definitely in, in, in around credit credit risk and credit scoring that we that I mentioned. But uh, I think that's that's around bias, for example, right? I don't know. From, from looking at your uh, transactions, can I conclude your age? Probably yes. Um, and and can we make sure that the model is not age biased, although it's clearly not uh, using uh, age? I say that yes as well. It's possible, and it's it's mandatory to do so. Um, so I think it's becoming more and more complex when the technology is is getting better and better. We need better and better regulation techniques. Um, but I think the, the challenge on the complexity is also people as well. As we go on this one here now, it's becoming very, very interdisciplinary area that before not get involved so much with the model. Now we have to, for example, right? Com our compliance partner, our legal partner, and they have to deal with increasingly more complex and sophisticated methodology. So, so I think that's uh, something that uh, educating, you know, our compliance partner, our operational risk partner, our uh, 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 legal partner is super, super critical. I think that's, uh, I think, how to look at it holistically and everybody into this. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the, the threat vectors continue to evolve. Um, that, that's that's for sure, right? And and something we have to be very, very cautious of. You know, super, super fascinating session here. Agus, Roy, Mira, we talked about data, explainability, and how, you know, the rules need to apply to everyone. Um, you know, and then some, we are, I think, a responsible organization. This needs to transcend into the tech world also. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they need to apply smart algos because we've seen algos run amok there, right? And right. Um, yeah. some of the political turmoil that we face is, you know, right. any engagement isn't good engagement, right? Um, and, you know, we're not, you know, stealing people's mm -hmm. data and we're not trying to monetize mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was a fact out there that, you know, if you have a MacBook, you know, you're better at credit risk, but then unfortunately MacBooks are, you know, bought by a certain class of people, right? And so you have to, it's gonna be very interesting how the guardrails are gonna continue to ebb and flow. What yeah, can you yeah. use, what can't you use? And I think in the spirit of fairness, but again, you know, super, super fascinating. Um, and it'll, it'll be interesting to come back maybe in a couple of years here uh, with Patrika <laughs> and have this discussion and kind of reminisce on what we talked about here and what happens in the next two years um, in terms of the crystal ball that we talked about. But right. Agus, Roe, Mira, thank you so much for being a great panelist here. And, um, you know, I hope the audience enjoyed it and we'll stay connected. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for moderating. Thank you so much to all of our awesome panelists. This has been an incredible discussion and a special thanks to Salah for moderating and keeping the conversation going. I too am excited to see how this uh, all turns out in five years. So we'll meet you back here. <laughs> All right, for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure to accept your connection request and check out our awesome AI exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around. <laughs>